Um, my name is John McLaughlin. I, uh, I work for Cloud Health by VMware. Um, next year, I'll be celebrating my 25th year in technology, so it's been a heck of a run, I guess. And uh, first half of that year was in more like the VMware data center land, actually. Second half has been all public cloud, you know, with Amazon. So uh, I'm here to talk a little bit about some of the concepts and constructs that are driving cloud management into the future. And so I'd like to just sort of quickly introduce Cloud Health a little bit. You know, we've been doing this for a while. We kind of started in 2012. Been, been at this show since 2012. Um, really enjoy taking cloud spend, Amazon specifically, usage, performance, et cetera, organizing it, do thing, making sure that people are getting efficiency out of it. So the more interesting pieces, I think, are we have over 7,000 customers, 200 partners specific to the public cloud space, uh, and we manage over 1.8 billion assets across our, our platform. So, um, you know, so we've been doing it for a little while. We've figured out some trick, tips and tricks, and we want to talk a little bit about how do we ratify some concepts that can be standards that we can utilize going forward so that maybe we can make some of these things more efficient and easier. So the agenda for today, sort of four high, high line items. Um, what are the existing challenges here? What are we actually trying to accomplish? Why are the ability for us to run workloads so complicated, right? Why do people spend so much time kind of trying to figure it out and what, what's causing that to happen in the market? Secondarily is, um, who is working in these cloud environments, right? So uh, that the used to be back in the day that, you know, there's a developer, there's a cloud, go write some software, off you go, right? Now we have to, you know, public companies are closing their books and you're making big bets on the ability for cloud dynamics to, you know, give you lift and capabilities, but you have to govern it and secure it and all the other good things that come along with that. And so to do that and to do that successfully, what will cloud management need to look like? What do we need to change about what we're doing today to be successful? And then what are those use cases? Let's, let's look at what the combination of technology and what people need to do in their roles to bring that together and to actually generate success, right? So that the, the world is getting better, that you're not just you know, swimming upstream, drowning forever, right? So, um, so let's talk about complexity for a little bit, right? The, the hope of the public cloud, and, and I think a lot of people can realize this, is agility, right? So the ability to scale seamlessly, the ability to be able to take advantage of new services and systems without a lot of collateral damage, right? You're not held back by waiting for something to be deployed or otherwise, but rather what you're looking at today is, look, I can get the developer in the cockpit right away. They can iterate quickly release PRs every day and get to a point where they're delivering more value to the customer with less risk. But the reality of that is, is that we're dealing with the, the legacy of our own selves at some level, and there's a lot of complexity that you take on to be successful at accomplishing the task of generating great workloads that, that solve people's problems, right? So, you know, 80% of people are suspected to be overrunning their budget in the next 12 months, right? not a good place to be when you're trying to hold the bottom line. Uh, there's security concerns at every level. You've heard of some of these in the news recently, right? Banks and financial institutions not having a good year, right? There's been at least three or four instances where misconfiguration or bad usage has caused people to struggle, right? So I want to break into what some of these complications are, right? It's the amount of services that we're dealing with, right? At this point in your world, you could deal with IaaS, up to SaaS services, Kubernetes, containers, serverless functions, right? There's, there's just a wide range of capability in the system, but each one of those comes with its own pitfalls and, and strengths. Uh, similarly, there's just a lot of overhead to all the people that you have to manage, right? You're talking about hundreds of developers or thousands of developers, people interacting as customers, people being able to take advantage of different technology, and then your own teams and the people that you interact with those are all people that you have to service with getting them the right access, getting them the right capability, making sure that they're hitting best practices, right? And so the way that we classify this generally is, is that there's a gap between 
how fast public cloud is driving new service and the speed with which we can adopt those services and actually apply governance and automation to them. And so that gap has been growing, right? So Amazon's keynotes, you know, have been announcing new database types and new services and machine learning capabilities and all this uh, amazing potential, but getting that into the hands of the people who need to use it and making them successful with it is the hurdle. And that hurdle is starting to get worse. So as we walk through this, what we see is, this is a quote from Gartner saying, look, over the next you know, three years or so, we're gonna end up seeing more leverage on those cloud services. Three times as much effort's gonna go against running SaaS and public cloud than anything else in IT. It's gonna take all of our resources because there's so much leverage in using those technologies. And so we wanna go through and say, well, how do we rationalize that into a whole? How do we actually make a picture where everyone can take advantage of this technology but they're not creating headaches for themselves and others down the road. So I'm gonna go through a couple of examples in the ecosystem, right? Um, one of these examples is, and I don't expect you to read this because it's utterly unreadable. Um, this is the Cloud Native Computing Foundation's uh, view of Kubernetes as of like a month ago. Uh, they release the core product of Kubernetes every 90 days. So you're, you're just the core product is cycling every 90 days in your environment. And now here's an ecosystem of players and technologies that are attempting to be part of that. How do you rationalize that? How do you deal with the fact that there's hundreds of, of players in, in dozens of categories? And you might think to yourself, look, Kubernetes, okay, that's a new tech, right? It's not so bad in the real world, you know, when you, when you get stable and you understand what's going on. So I included one more of these examples, which is something that I think all of us should hope is stable. It's security, right? So another environment is how do you deal with cloud security? And this is something we should have been dealing with for the last 12 years and have been. But again, these ecosystems are enormous. And they're not you know, consolidating, they're actually growing because all these new services that drive capability in the platforms all have their own ways of being interacted with, right? An unlocked S3 bucket that's publicly available is, is dangerous, but an Elasticsearch cluster that you can log into without a password, equally dangerous, totally different semantics on how you operate those services. So talking about complexity, what we have to end up doing is, is to narrow our focus, right? And the first area of focus that we want to put into highlight is the people who are operating and their concerns that they have in the environment. So this is a view of, you know, sort of your classic enterprise that's burgeoning into the public cloud world and there's a, a lot of different heads of state here, right? There's your CSO, your CIO, your CFO, your CTO, your CEO, whatever, right? And they all have different concerns. They're, they're looking at things very differently from one another. One might be trying to drive to a compliance standard regardless of what it affects the developer for, while another is just saying, look, I need to get production features out there or else we're not gonna get customers, right? And so there's a couple of broad axes that these personas fall on, right? There's the technical personas, you know, your DevOps people, your cloud ops people, developers, and your non-technical personas, you know, line of business owners and business analysts and staff accountants. There's also a break in the pattern where uh, we're not centralized as much anymore in the public cloud. So you have still central functions that are consulting to other businesses, but you also have line of business functions that are working independently to deliver products and value, right? And they're able to sort of guide their own ship in the public cloud because it's API driven and they can just use tooling and third party tooling to make that story work. So the goal here is though that there needs to be a substrate that, that these people can communicate on because just emails and ad hoc spreadsheets and hoping and praying and, and maybe having a conversation at the water cooler is only gonna go so far and uh, to hold people accountable and to actually drive forward in this market, you need a blueprint for the functions that need to happen at a broad scale, and then the technologies that need to fold into these roles so that everyone is communicating over the same substrate so that you really drive change, right? So it's, it's easy for a security person to say, I found a thousand problems. I can't do anything about any of them because I don't own the CI CD pipeline. I don't own you know, what technologies are being chosen. So you need a way to be able to help there. So 
we've taken the 7,000 customers that we've worked with and sort of looked holistically at what are the real common steps in a public cloud journey that they've gone through at a high level and then at a low level. And so we're gonna dive into that. But when you take the people and you look at what they do, the first step in this sort of journey is just where is everything and what is it doing and, and how is it configured and what's going on, right? So you need to understand, you know, you have to name your evil and know what's going on before you can make change. You can't understand what a risk is unless you know where everything is. And you're talking hundreds of accounts, orgs, you know, all these different capabilities, regions, availability zones, and they each have their own semantics to what's important, right? And as you step into that, you start talking about what is the optimization for those capabilities, right? So you wanna look at things like, how am I optimized for security? How am I optimized for cost? How am I optimized to be efficient in the system? And that leads you to, to best practices and standards, right? So the goal here is, is that you wanna get to standards that you can share broadly and automate those standards so that you no longer worry about all these different things that are going on at the lowest level. And then finally, if we're being honest with ourselves, and I'm sure, I mean, how many people in this room feel like they're like a technical user of the cloud versus a business user of the cloud? Technical users? Good, good number? Businessy more, you know, users? Good number, right? So there's a big split in here. We have, you know, maybe a 60-40 split of personas that way. And so we're all trying to figure out the same things. And at the, at the top end here, you need to connect this back to a, an ROI, a cost of goods sold, a, a KPI that means something to your business because you can't just infinitely launch technology and play with it in isolation. You're not gonna end up anywhere good. So we've drawn together over the last few years a blueprint of what we believe a good cloud management solution needs to look like. And it's not any one tool. It's in fact sets of tools, very disparate, but we believe in that this picture represents a total view of a functional approach to understanding your environment and actually being able to draw uh, capability out of that environment. So I'm gonna quickly walk it up from the bottom to the top and I have some follow on collateral for the circles so I'll talk about that in a minute. But from the bottom, we're talking about all the different layers of, of technology that you're operating on, right? The raw technology of virtual machines and containers and platform services and serverless should be on here, right? It should be everywhere that you run a workload, everywhere that you run something that changes your environment. And the, and the first piece is what we were talking about, right? Bring that data layer together and model it so that a VPC isn't divorced from the instances that are running in it. The EBS volumes that are attached need to all be part of a cohesive picture so that when you do threat detection or when you provision something that you have a cognizant view of what's going on here, right? What, what does it mean in the, in the greater picture of launching a new service or making sure that you're uniform across your services? As you step up you, across all these different capabilities, you need governance. And governance is really about a couple of different things. In the security sense of governance, you're talking about keep, keeping people out of your world. And in the interior governance that is your day-to-day -day life, you're talking about best practices that keep people from shooting themselves in the foot. <laughs> so the idea here is, look, there's a, there's a set of best practices by standard. You know, you might run against a GDPR standard or a NIST standard, et cetera, right? There's also the best practices of security, you know, usage security, configuration security, endpoint security. You need a way of dealing with all those concepts together and governing and automating the outcomes of that so that you have closed loop remediation of what's going on in your environment so that you're not exposed. As you move through this, there's these areas of excellence that I'm gonna talk about, but above that, it's the ability for all those different people who are working in the cloud to actually talk to each other and actually give meaningful insight to the actions that you need to take every day. So if a financial person is saying you're over budget and you go, I can't do anything about that, you have a serious problem on your hands, but if, you, if a financial person can look at your usage and say, I just noticed that this application is you know, starting to grow, you can pinpoint what's going on and you can start taking actions to potentially re-architect or reconfigure or auto-scale or right-size. There's lots of functions there. And then at the top, again, it's this conjoinment of what is a good KPI? Is it a cost per user, a cost per API call, an availability, uh, a, a, a compliance to a standard, right? These are all the things that matter 
to feed the system so that at the beginning you know what you're building your technology for and at the end you're making sure that you've actually hit the goal of the service that you're offering to the to business. All right, so just jumping through these uh, relatively quickly, um, the first pillar here, if you will, is cost and optimization, right? It, it's, a, it's the flip side of usage. You know, as you run services, they cost something, and that's the, the public cloud way, right? It's a, a metered billing model. So you have to deal with the fact that optimizing for cost is, is in a way optimizing for usage, right? If you write a better function in code, you will use less infrastructure, and then there's a cost associated with that. And so being able to do that type of forecasting, being able to do the work it takes to really understand what those functions are and where there's leverage for you to re-architect or use new technology um, is a part of the cost and optimization journey. It's also part of your technical journey for delivering value to back to the business. On the security side, this is more in the realm of real time, right? So the very first thing that you need to know is, am I compliant to the policies and capabilities of my infrastructure, the things that I'm hanging my hat on, right, that I tell my auditors and, my, and the, the market that you know, we're compliant. We, we hit all the compliances of my business. Well, to do that, you have to be able to know when there's a, an anomaly, in real time, assess what that anomaly is and what the remediation is and who to signal and when, right? And so be that a closed loop signal of, look, I, I just know that that S3 bucket should never come up as public and I just shut it down immediately to a, something complicated like you haven't rotated any of your keys in this one account for the last 180 days. Um, you're, you want a system that in, uh, can go across the entire gamut of security capability to really draw your compliance to a, a standard. And so the idea here is, is that there's, there's dozens of standards, right? We're not, we're not able to work against any one standard anymore. There's no cookie cutter blueprint and, and frankly, people are using custom standards more often than not, right? Your business, if you're in finance, is a very different standard than uh, in the entertainment and gaming industry, right? Where in gaming, you might be worried about people trying to hack you to go you know, steal skins. In finance, you're worried that people are actually stealing real dollars and you know, setting the world on fire, right? So as we step through this, provisioning and orchestration becomes a pillar that represents the discipline that you need before you deliver code to the system. So every PR that you release is value to the customer, right? That, but there's an opportunity there for bugs, there's an opportunity there for risk to be created. And so we want to deliver as many PRs as possible, right? 50, 100, however many a day. But we don't want to open ourselves to additional risk through those PRs, be them infrastructure as code type of things, all the way down to just the functions and abilities of a, of a website you know, on, the, on the public internet. And so to do that, you have to be able to plug into CI-CD systems, right? You need to be able to get signal from noise. You need to be able to do analytics about how effective is your CI pipeline at getting code to market and how effective are your developers, how much friction are your developers feeling through that pipeline. And again, there's millions, well not millions, there's, there's dozens of these capabilities, right? We're looking at Cloud formation and Elastic Beanstalk and Terraform and Chef and Puppet and I can just keep going, right? There's so many of these capabilities for delivering code that, again, you need someone who can abstract some of that knowledge because if you're distributed across an enterprise, you're probably going to have multiples of these running in parallel with each other. But there are commonalities to what is risk and what does it mean. And so we want to drive towards that. Stepping into the backside after you provision code, there's operations and analytics, right? This concept is uh, probably the most straightforward to technology, uh, you know, technologists in the room. You broke something, you gotta figure out what's wrong with it. And it may be broken from an app's perspective, it could be a custom metric that's representative of you know, some app falling over. Could be in the infrastructure, it could be some EBS volume that's just not reacting right. You need to just cycle it and get a new piece of, of infrastructure in place. And then the analytics to understand that there's, if the trends that are happening in your environment are actually going to cause you to go tipping over a scalability edge that you're never going to get back from, right? So, oh, you know, I'm growing 20% my user connections against my data store every quarter. That's fine to a limit. And then suddenly you're never coming back, right? So you need to know ahead of uh, sort of these unavoidable moments when you need to re-architect, when you need to re-understand 
what technology you're using and in what format you're using them. So the idea here is, is that you can get recommendations for where you're going with your technology and embracing the new things, right? They just announced managed Cassandra, which thank God someone did that because having set up a Cassandra database in my past, it is a lot of operational hurdles to do it. It's a very, very powerful database, but man, it's a lot. So th there's a lot of greatness in getting to that consistency of operations, but to do that well, you have to understand all the semantics of the system. And so understanding the 200 services that Amazon offers, or the 250 at this point, is one piece of it, but then understanding all the SaaS services and the software packages and frameworks that ride on top of that technology, you're starting to get to a point where, again, humans really can't keep up. They need to have help through partnership and through automation to be able to get things done. And so this next piece is a, really about being able to blueprint out what a workload looks like, right? Why can't we get a developer to production in the first week that they're writing a new service? Why do we have to you know, provision accounts and get the configuration right and make sure that all the configurations are right, et cetera? You should be able to just snapshot out the different types of services that are important to you and deliver them consistently over and over again so that if someone wants to quickly iterate on a new concept, they, they get a safe environment that they understand that has all the right semantics they play with it, they commit what they want, and when they're ready, they promote it to production. And it's not a big deal that you know, these microservice and architectures that we're building on top of things like containerization and, and lambdas and otherwise, uh, that we, we spend less time worrying about the mechanics and more time delivering value in code. So that ultimately you get to the point where customers are seeing value day over day and they're starting to get excited about what they're seeing in your platform, right? Finally, is, is embracing the fact that we live in this really complicated ecosystem. This ecosystem has been growing uh, and like since I started my career when the first SaaS vendors came out, right? It was like 97 or 98, you know, there was 10, something like that, right? There was no clouds then, it was just sort of virtualization, it was just a new thing. Now, uh, there's, I mean, the vendor's floor is like, thousands of different brands and capabilities. Like I, I, I struggle to keep up with the concept, right? It's like, it's insane how many SaaS services, how many capabilities on top of Amazon that are coming out that people are taking advantage of. And so you need an ecosystem partner that can enable that for you, give you the safety and control that you need, give you a catalog that you can give to your developers again so you can embrace that DevOps model of stay out of the way and let a developer play more than trying to command and control what's going on. All right, so now I've talked to you a little bit about a couple of different things. I've talked to you about what the problem set is, um, you know, why there's complexity. I've talked to you a little bit about the people who are involved with dealing with that complexity. And now I wanna talk a little bit about how we could manage those functions, that, those services that are out there with the people who need to operate those services and create use cases and look at some use cases to talk about how you actually solve these problems utilizing these concepts, right? So the goal here is to kind of take three sort of broad use cases that should invariably be meaningful to you in your lives. You probably have run into these things before and then try to inject the concept that if, if there was a way for us to all communicate over the same data successfully, that we would be able to smooth out a lot of the pain and time and effort and cost that goes into delivering these capabilities. So this is just a model of looking at how people can interact with technology, right? They can observe what's going on. They can collaborate over what they find. They can take recommendations or create recommendations that are important to their environment. They can automate those recommendations and integrate them so that Everyone's aware of what's going on. Why did this change happen and what does it mean to my business? All right, so diving into the first one. It's a security use case, right? Some CSO out there, you know, and some business owner is saying, we want to start taking credit card information. We don't want to tokenize it. We actually want to store credit cards. Sounds like a good idea. I've done that a couple times in my life. It, you know, seems like it'll be fun. You know, why not? You can charge people and keep their information. <laughs> Uh, it turns out to be that there's a standard there, the payment card holder industry standard for doing that. It's very detailed in sort of broad controls that you must meet to be successful. And 
So to do an effort like this, you're talking, uh, when I did my first one, uh, over a year's worth of time spent trying to build an infrastructure environment that actually conformed to every standard that you needed for access and security, for data retention, for sovereignty of data, continuity, et cetera, right? There's a, there was a lot to it at that time. But we should be able to do this faster, and we should be able to do this better because we've generated better services and better capabilities into our platform to do that work, right? So walking through this use case, right, the CSO says, great, I have to uh, support a new standard. Uh, I'm gonna talk to my security architects and my security specialists and say, go tell me where I am right now. Am I 80% of the way to PCI or am I 10% of the way to PCI? And what, will, what does that mean when we say that we're not, we've done 10% of the overall need for the system or not? Let's take those standards where they stand, understand it, observe it, see it, and now let's catalog it so that we have the ability to go and talk to the line of business owners and say, okay, um, we need to come up with ways to actually implement the standards that we're missing and to conform ourselves around this new capability that we want to offer our customers. And so you end up in a situation where you're looking at what are the standards that you need to draw out to be successful? What are the things that DevOps people in their environments and developers need to make sure are true so that they're not handcuffing themselves to a, a security standard that won't let them develop any more code? but also allow them to hit all the standards that exist. As we keep going, right, you may not know the answer to what the standard asked for, right? They, they're, there's some vagueness to some of these capabilities. For instance, you know, they say you need to keep some amount of logs near line, right? You have to be able to access them right away. But you also need some longer amount of logs that are on storage, you know, some tape or whatever in the old days, but they don't, they don't specify. And so you want recommendations that drive that change in your system so that you actually know that, it, oh, it should be three months of, of data on S3, it can be 12 months on Glacier, and we're good, right? We've hit the standard. And so the idea here is, is that a platform should understand what those standards are and help drive you towards those answers to the questions that you're going to be asking with the least amount of effort so that you don't have to hire a million dollar consultancy to come in and tell you exactly what that standard needs to look like. And in fact, that's what my company did you know, 15 odd years ago was we just had consultants come in and we talked to them for a year to try to accomplish this. But a good cloud management platform who, which understands standards should be able to drive you to those standards because they shouldn't be different. The whole point is that there's uniformity to what people are trying to accomplish. Now, people build different code and there's different services, and so you have to be able to conform yourself around the technology choices you've made, but ultimately the safety and security of the system should be maintained. And then finally, I mean, auditors come in every six months or every three months and say, hey, we gotta recertify your environment for the standard that you've established. That's great, but the way that they do that is they say, prove to me that at no point in the lifetime of your environment did you actually have a problem, right, that you were exposed that someone got in and made a problem for your environment. And the reality is the only way to do that is to ensure that you keep up with every change that's going on. But change management can't be human driven. It can't, you can't authorize tens of thousands of changes a month. Uh, you need to instead be able to build a backlog of those changes and observe ones that are anomalous that represent risk, but keep the, the chain of custody in the line so that you know what was happening at any point. And so when they say, on October 5th, who logged into all of your PCI systems? Great, here's an audit log, off you go, pass the audit, don't waste your time, you know, trying to pull together tickets and otherwise and exceptions and everything else that was going on. A platform should be able to enable you to do that. So that's security, right? This is, again, the important thing here is, is that there's a wide variety of different people in different roles who have to collaborate over building standards, and then automating those standards so that you don't worry about these things anymore, that you don't spend time on them, that ultimately this is underneath the waterline and an abstraction that you don't think about. So let's go on to cost, right? Let's, uh, let's take a look at what's going on in the cost world. What we see in cost is frequently uh, a CFO is saying something along the lines of, why are these guys spending so much money on Amazon? <laughs> Tens of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars a year 
on technology, uh, you know, I used to know five years in advance how much data center equipment I was going to go buy, and I could just amateurize that out and say it's going to be $100 million, right? Now I, I don't see that anymore. I don't know what's going on. I don't know how to deal with the, the different workloads and work types. I don't know how to align these costs to cost centers. I don't know how to deal with amortization and depreciation, all these concepts that are requirements of accounting that no one wants to deal with in the technologist realm, right? Like, we want to be able to just automate these things out of our lives so that everyone has the answers that they need and that you don't need to worry about, you know, what's my forecast for next year or what's the budget or what's going on with, you know, why we've grown the cost of a service so much. And so to do that, you really want to be able to take the questions and understand what a financial institute want, institution wants from you and then just plug in the answers so that they can just keep going to the same well and asking the same questions, closing the books month in and month out, making sure that their forecasts are in alignment with what the reality is of what your business is going to do. And so to do that, right, you, you again, it's the same story. You need to build a story around how do you tell the story of what's going to happen to your services. Now, some of this can be just a heuristic-based analysis, right? If you're not making major changes to a static service and it's growing 5% year over year, you're probably going to estimate that it's going to continue to grow 5% year over year. When you look at a service and you say, hey, uh, I know I'm releasing something new this quarter and it's going to be huge. It's going to be the biggest thing that the world has ever seen. What you end up seeing in that scenario is, look, you need to have an annotation in the system that says, I'm going to have a burst of $50,000 in the first month and it's going to tail off as, as people go. When I worked in the game industry, this was like the common pattern of a marketing launch for a game would you know, shoot up for the first week. Everyone would be playing the game and trying to figure out what it was, and then slowly it would fade off as the next game came along and someone else wanted to use it. And these were predictable patterns, right? And so because of that, you know, we struggled a little bit um, to, to get the information into the business people's hands to be successful. And so, again, this is a substrate that you want to work on to really understand. And ideally, what ends up happening here is that you actually just drive it into their accounting software directly with no human interaction, and it's just a closed loop process that you stop worrying about, right? No one wants to generate these you know, Excel tables and reports and all this capability that represents like, yeah, I needed to get a new Redshift cluster, right? Like, or I need to buy an RI, or whatever it was, right? Or a savings plan these days. Um, so, so the idea here is, is look, make this a closed loop system just like you would your CI CD system, right? This is something that you can use technology to, to, to get better at. And again, the, the, uh, that substrate needs to be able to handle technical use cases just as much as non-technical use cases. So I want to go through one more of these and then I, I'm going to summarize and I, I want to be able to open up the floor to questions too. But I'm going to talk a little bit about governance, which is probably the most hairy one of these because you need governance everywhere, right? So the idea here is, is that in the land of governance, everything has to be at some level monitored at two levels. You both need a centralized control point of some kind where someone is overseeing what the standards are and then a decentralized line of business approach that allows you to actually make the changes necessary to your environment to be successful. And there's an art and a science to this. It's not something that is a one size fit all as we've seen with our customers, right? We have some customers that operate with a, a central model where all of the different business units come together and have a summit every year and decide what their goals are, what their KPIs are for their business units. And then they drive them and then they measure them and they, they move forward. Other people say, I don't wanna know what anyone is doing. I have hundreds of teams each one of them can do whatever the heck they want. All I care about is that they're secure, or all I care about is you know, some basis of what they're doing. But again, the first thing that you need to do is build those standards, right? Observe where those standards are, and then where you want to take it. And honestly, a little bit of a shame back model here goes a long way, right? The ability to know that team one is only 20% optimized for costs, and maybe 80% optimized for security, and team two is, 0% optimized for costs and 0% optimized for security drives a lot of behavioral changes. And so when you can benchmark people and really understand where they stand against the things that you care about, you're able to drive the change in your business that honestly is very 
elusive because it's so easy for us to just think about the next great thing and I gotta build that next feature or I, I, I don't wanna worry about some of these outside concerns that really affect the bottom line and really affect the posture of your environment but are hard. So you wanna be able to drive that type of observability both at that central and that line of business. So as we look at collaborating over these things, right, uh, there, people have tons of initiatives that they end up doing where, hey, you know, this month we're gonna make sure that our storage costs are in line, right? That we're gonna prune all those EBS volumes we're not using, delete all those snapshots, you know, build some lifecycle policies, great, you know, and that is awesome, right? Uh, and, and we wanna work together to build the, the, those standards that you want to have. You know, and the next month there's the next initiative, right? Oh, we've got wasted zombie infrastructure. We gotta turn off all the dev servers that we're not using anymore, right? But again, there's all these sort of high and low marks of sort of being able to optimize. And the goal of a good platform will be to optimize it by leveling this all out, right? What we wanna be able to see is that at all times that you're running the optimal pattern and that at all times you understand what your initiatives are and that honestly that you can present that up the chain and say, hey CIO, hey CTO, stop worrying so much about some of these things because you can see just as well as I can that we're hitting all the, the controls that we need to have, that we're being successful. And so as we walk through this, we wanna look at you know, what those recommendations are, the same story, right? Take those recommendations, apply them, build best practices and standards that are important to what you're trying to deliver, and then automate those standards and drive them home. And so the idea here is, is that, again, uniformity comes in many different varieties. There's uniformity of technology, there's uniformity of, of processes and controls. You want to have a uniform environment because it lowers the amount of cognitive load that you push into your system. Right? If you have 10 different ways of orchestrating containers, you're gonna to need to have 10 different people who understand those 10 different ways. If you have 100 different ways of deploying applications, each one of those can break in novel and interesting and terrible ways. And you need to make sure that you're building a governance where you're driving yourself towards the best practices. Now, I'm not saying that there should be one size fits all for these types of scenarios. I actually think in reality what's going on is that there's probably a, a grouping of scenarios that you want to manage towards, but to, to be successful at doing that, you really have to think hard about what architecture needs to look like. What are the common services you want? Do you want to have one SQL-based pattern and one NoSQL-based pattern? Do you want to drive a, a data lake concept? You know, where do you want to do that? How do you want to do that? Right? So, again, knowing where you stand and what you're driving towards, what's naturally organically happening in the lines of business, is critical to the success and capability of the system. So I just wanna wrap up, right, and then take some questions and let's talk about some of these use cases. Um, look, we all, I assume, love the cloud. We're at this conference for a reason. I think it's one of the, I mean, if not the greatest piece of technology that's come out, at least in my lifetime, to be a high leverage point for what we're trying to accomplish. Um, but it's not getting easier. It's getting a lot harder, actually, as we grow. Secondarily, the people who used to be involved in public cloud decisions is also growing. Uh, when I started in the public cloud in 2008, I was a developer and a, kind of a DevOps guy. I signed up with a credit card, kind of got started, built my first service. It was great. Um, but as we saw and as we see, we're now growing into a, a situation where there's a lot of different concerns because this is so paramount to the success of a company. And it's a huge investment to, to make into a set of technologies that are gonna define how you're gonna move forward with your applications for the next 10 years or, or longer, right? And the whole goal of the system that, that exists for cloud management is actually to lower cognitive load. Again, we stand on the shoulders of giants. We don't think in you know, we don't think about plumbing and electricity anymore. We don't worry about building codes when we're in this building, right? And technology needs to get there also, right? We build on the, the RFCs that were put out in the 70s and 80s, you know, TCP IP and all the capabilities of, you know, of, of the HTTP protocol, et cetera. Well, we need to start doing that in the public cloud too. We need to start legitimizing the practices that we're doing 
so that we all can stand on those shoulders so we can abstract better. When we look at you know, serverless and getting to the point where we're just pushing PRs into repos to, to deliver code, you know, what we're saying is, is that we're going to drop out a lot of the, the noise and, and agree that our environment should just be a certain way, right? If you want to use Kubernetes, you've just landed yourself on a great standard. And so those standards are critical for us. But we've been cycling our standards over the last you know, 10 years, right? We went IaaS and PaaS and serverless and containerization. You know, some, at some point, that's going to cool down, and we just want to start thinking about the value we drive to customers. And then finally, we're not going to have the ability to do this unless we talk to each other. Right? The, the people who held their hands up who were those business use case holders and they were saying, look, you know, I, I need to understand club management because I want to be successful at business are as or more important than all the technologists who raised their hands saying, look, I just want to deliver great features and capabilities and technology to the platform. And so both of those things are, are really critical to the environment being operating correctly. But you have to be able to work together over those things and then ultimately agree and then automate them out of your life, right? S simply put, we don't want to have to think about cloud management and the right tooling will make it so that these things drop out of our lives. All right, and with that, I'd, I'd love to open it up to questions about this area. You know, if people have questions, and I, I'm gonna, I hope people do, I'd love to open up to a conversation a little bit. So I think there's mics, but I'll repeat questions too. Anyone have any thoughts? Anything that's stuck out to them? Yeah. All right. Thanks. Hello. Okay. Hey. So um, I really appreciate the get out of the way, let the developer play, but I also appreciate the 360 governance. So that's a it's a dichotomy that has to come together, right? What we are facing in our adoption of cloud is each one of these actor groups that you enumerated in your presentation actually is trying to create their own guardrails and governances, and they're taking the concepts of the old, you know, in on-prem infrastructure stuff, and they're trying to box AWS into that, and that's a big problem for us. So I just wanted to, I mean, you've had you know, lots of clients, they probably went through that journey. How did you approach that problem where you want to let the organization experiment freely and mm -hmm. not lock them down, but also create the governance model that is very encompassing all the way to even financial management? Right, it's a great question, right? Um, so uh, our journey started with uh, the born in the cloud players, right? So we were lucky in that way because the born in the cloud people never asked that question, they just said, I'm Twitter, I'm just going, you know, or whatever, I'm, you know, whatever technology company there is out there, I'm just high flying, right? Um, the companies that you're talking about, sort of that late majority, um, it, it is uh, uh, sort of, there's two approaches. One is this sort of top-down educational approach, uh, well-architected program, best practices, uh, a partnership with tools and technologies that drive that capability, and the other is a bottom-up uh, approach where um, you start by trusting a little bit more, right? You give people access to the environment in a way that they can't hurt themselves, and then you are auditing sort of asynchronously as an administrator of that environment rather than as an operator of that environment. So let people settle into whatever the reality of their service needs to be, and then stamp it so that it's asynchronous. You're not, you're not saying, look, you have to go through the security audit and then the change management process and then the... The, the problems that exist. We, we don't want that anymore. But rather, you want to administrate alongside that substrate. So it's, it's sort of a parallel path. Operators and developers you know, delivering value. Administrators making sure that there's checkpoints along the way, but aren't getting in the way. Hopefully that answered your question a little bit. All right. More? More questions? I love questions. All right. Sure, got one for you. Okay, so... Um a lot of enterprises are moving towards a hybrid cloud. Um, if you introduce something like Outpost, slam dunk to manage that on-prem or private cloud with AWS, is Amazon thinking about um, going even further and 
trying to provide or offer a management interface for other public cloud uh, management? Oh, interesting. So you're thinking apply the concepts that Amazon has pioneered more broadly against workloads wherever they live, yeah. right? Um, I don't know the answer to that question, but I can tell you what my, my theory there is, which is Outpost is a step towards that standardization that we were talking about, right? Where we're, regardless of where a workload needs to run, you know, if you're a financial institution and you have to be secured in your data center environment, great, run Outpost, you can get the same APIs, the same connectivity. Um, I, I, I see that, and VMware is sort of pioneering that with them, right? You can run RDS databases on vSphere, and, and now you can run VMC, you know, vSphere on Amazon. So I think that hybrid approach is um, the conjoinment of what you're describing, where you will be able to manage the same technology in either way, in either location. Um, going wider than that, uh, I, I'm not sure I'm legally, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I, I think, um, I'm not sure. Um, I, I, it would make a lot of sense, but um, there's a little bit of, you know, where do, where do you want the workload to live type of questions that happen from there. For, for us, though, our goal will be to manage workloads wherever they live, consistent operations, consistent views, so that you don't have so much overload trying to understand where your workloads are. Other questions? A few more minutes. I'd love, I'd love to you know, try to generate a conversation. I know it's a big room for that. So. Anyone suffering from this right now? No? OK. <laughs> Is there anything you didn't feel like you know, I didn't scratch a niche on? You know, the, some area of operational excellence or administrative excellence that is required to be successful? Because otherwise, I'm going to give you guys a little bit of your time back. All right. Well, one thing I, I need to tell you, though, is please stop by our booth. You know, VMware's got a gigantic booth in the front of the expo floor. We're talking about this the whole the rest of the conference. We can give you demos of what we've built in this space and what we're going to continue to pioneer. We think that when you get this story straight, you actually end up starting to actually not worry so much about this environment. So with that, I'm going to thank you guys, and I appreciate your time and attention.